Stay hungry, stay foolish. Welcome to today's episode, part of the Exponential series here on The Innovation Show, where we explore exponentially advancing technologies and how they are changing the world. As always, thank you to our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services and powering its customers by making innovative financial services accessible to all. Check them out on hellozai.com. Over and over, we see big legacy businesses getting beaten to the punch by energetic little startups. It seems like innovation can come only from the bottom up and from the outside in. But our guest today tells us that big equals slow and stodgy is a myth. Based on decades of experience working with both the world's leading brands and disruptive startups, his book explores the opportunity legacy companies have to create new markets, supercharge growth, and remake their businesses by combining the mindset and tool belt of startups with the benefits of incumbency. Boatloads of consumer data, decades of brand equity, robust distribution channels, enormous financial assets, and much more. He goes deeply into why pace and dynamics of innovation have changed so dramatically in recent years and shows how companies can overcome obstacles like the eight deadly sins of stasis. Equally important, he provides a playbook on how to use these insights in your own company, team or career. This fast paced, anecdote rich book rethinks modern innovation. It's a great pleasure to welcome the author of From Incremental to Exponential, How Large Organizations Can See the Future and Rethink Innovation. Ismail Amla, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan. Good to be here. It's great to have you with us. And behind me, you'll see I have two copies. That means one is up for grabs for you, the audience. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter and you will be in with a chance to, to win a copy of that book. Ismael, I absolutely love the book. I have told our audience already that this is part of a multi-part episode, which is great. And I thank you in advance for your time. But let's get into it because there's so much to, to cover in this book. You focus on the world of technology consulting, coaching legacy companies how to make better use of technology to improve their bottom lines and business processes. And you tell us in doing so you learned how difficult it is to get mega corporations to behave like startups. But you say an interesting thing has happened over the past decade, you began seeing clear signs of how large positive changes in giant companies you're advised have come to be. You said legacy companies may be slow and at times bureaucratic. We all know that. But they possess mountains of valuable data. And that is the currency of the 21st century. Perhaps you'll expand on this because this is a key point and something that's unusual for us to hear on this show. Yeah, no, thank you, Aidan. And, um, I, you know, I have been lucky in my career having worked with Accenture and IBM, uh, CSC uh, in the big world and then the small startup world of SEER Technologies and Capco to get the perspective from both sides. And uh, me and my fellow author, we've always been arguing around who has the best advantage of innovating. Is it a startup or is it a legacy company if they're both starting from the same position? And, and I'm increasingly, as you say, Eden, I'm increasingly getting so many different data points which says actually that the, the, the superpowers that a large organization has is what's becoming more and more apparent in the, the race for winning in the market and and the superpowers that are you know if I can sort of categorize them uh, that you'll all recognize is if you're thinking about a large large organization you're thinking about they have access to funding they have access to production and infrastructure they have expert access to expertise so you know you think about if you think about Amazon versus Walmart um, two big giants right now but at the time that one uh, Amazon was starting Walmart could definitely say they had access to distribution, they had access to uh, expertise. Uh, they had other things that, they didn't have other things that Amazon had, and I'm sure we'll come on to that. They also have access to distribution and access to data. Data will become really important as we have this discussion. I mean, just to give you an example, right? If you're thinking about, uh, let's say the largest beer company in the world, AB InBev, 
And then you're talking about these micro beers, very cool, very hit, hit. You can create them immediately. They really hit um, a particular audience. You can price them at the point you want to price them. The issue becomes with how do you get a toehold in the shelves and bars in a city in the USA if you're microbrewing in Europe or the other way around? And suddenly what you've got is this clear identification that channel is a huge superpower that these incumbents have, that the innovators, the startups don't have. So as I say, these five or six things really come together that I've been spotting anyway, uh, that really uh, gives huge advantage to some of the incumbents. We had a chat before we came on air and you've worked in many legacy organizations, established corporations. And the one thing that startups do have that we don't have in incumbent organizations is a different mindset. And by that, I mean that there's no protection, protection of the way things used to be. There's no status quo because you're building it from scratch. And that often blank slate is a huge advantage. And you were mentioning that how you can shift the culture in an organization becomes so important for people to open up to this. So they're not in this protective mindset, and they're open to new ideas. Maybe we'll share a bit on that, because this is where so many of our audience run aground. It's the human part of innovation. Yeah, no, that's a great part. Great point there, right? Because what we do have in the innovative world, as you say, is you don't have the baggage. And generally, the people who are doing it have this growth mindset. And the growth mindset driving a particular set of behaviors, uh, driving a particular set of results. Uh, and the big thing I think that we found uh, in, in large organizations who have been able to transform is the focus on this culture mindset reinforced by particular types of behavior and so on. I mean, again, um, you know, if, if I give you a, a couple of examples here, if you think about, if you think about Apple and the new Apple headquarters, here is a massive organization. What is it? The most valuable organization in the world today. Still known for its innovation, still known for the way that they work, but it's intentional. So, you know, they, Steve Jobs in, back in the day designs a uh, environment in the new headquarters, which is basically a donut where there's no corner office, symbolically, culturally really important. He puts everybody in there, including people from the Pixar company, including people from Apple, including different functional organizations who wouldn't have the opportunity or need to meet or talk. But the organizational design of that office ensures that you bump into each other and you are, the, the diversity of thought that's needed in innovation is organizationally designed, right? So, so in a startup, there's five of you, you're always talking to one another, whatever role you're doing. In a big organization, you've got to be intentional about how you create it. In a startup, you're a small team, you communicate really well. In a big organization, you have to be intentional. So Amazon have this two pizza rule. If your team is bigger than what can consume two pizzas, your team is too big. So, you know, I think, I think there is a lot to be said, of course, around the learning from the innovators but it has to be intentional in how you build it into your incubators, in, into your incumbent organizations to drive the same change. All right, so great example. And I heard this thing in France, I don't know if you know about this, but supposedly seniority is also displayed by the size of your office. And people will complain genuinely about, oh, my office is point one of a meter too small than it should be for my tenure in the organization. And that's just a symbol, a sim it's so symbolic of this mindset that's legacy organizations. It's fascinating. I love the example of Apple. Let's move on to one of the core theses of the book, which is why the speed of change is getting so much faster and the collision of so many of these different exponential trends. Maybe we'll get your view of what exponential trends are. And then it's this collision of them, how each is powering each other that's actually leading to this huge disruption in organizations? I think what's happening um, is the coming together of technology, which is more powerful, which is smaller, which is cheaper. Uh, and so suddenly, um, you know, we've all seen the pictures of, you know, the first computer offloaded from a big truck, which is like, you know, our iPhone is 20 times powerful than that big computer. So, you know, that is sort of symbolic of what we're seeing there. Um, 
But what we've actually, what, what we're seeing is as a result of that, we've got the availability of technology anywhere. Uh, it's cheap, skills anywhere across the world. It's accessible, funds anywhere. So you could do crowdfunding to build whatever you want to do and access to clients anywhere. Nobody's standing between you and a billion customers. So it's then a question of ideas and execution. And of course, we've seen some great examples of how um, these disruptive influences have come together to really disrupt industries. So we, you know, we, we've talked about, um, if, you, if you look at Google Maps, Google Maps is the, the data that's available, um, all sorts of geographical information. It's free, it's on your phone, and it's hugely disrupted the, the markets that Garmin and TomTom and all the other geographic data companies ha used to have. Uh, and the market capitalization of big businesses have gone, you know, I think Garmin was 16 billion or something in 2007. Google Maps comes up and, you know, that market value is destroyed enormously. And I think we will see more and more of that as we start to understand that knowledge isn't the core of valuation. It's the coming together of knowledge, insight, action, immediate access. And, and I, you know, I, I think back when you think about um, Google Maps or you think about sat navs and so on, that back in the days of Christopher Columbus, the maps held such a high value that it was the linchpin of the wealth of nations. It was it. That was it. That was how you actually created world dominance, world dominance. And here we are where it's actually free and create and, uh, and disrupting all sorts of industries. I love that you said the word knowledge because you actually talk about the knowledge, but this time a little bit different. This is the black cabs in London. I love the example here where you talk about, well, knowledge becomes free through Google Maps. That influences access to this knowledge, this new information, this data, and that changes the infrastructure, the, it recalibrates the business landscape. It changes how black cabs actually work. It also changes who can work in those black cabs and Uber comes into the game, as many as other players as well. I'd love you to share this because this is a huge example and a great example you give in the book. Yeah, and, and so and this is this is you know what, what a lot of us are talking about, which is um, you know the largest taxi company doesn't have any cars. The largest, which is Uber, the largest hotel organization, if you like, doesn't have any rooms. Airbnb, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is um, really supported at its core by the platform economy. And you could argue that the top five to seven companies in the world are all most valuable companies in the world are all platform companies, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Alibaba in China and so on. And, and how that is actually the, the, the idea of data matching, personalization is changing all the rules in almost all the industries. Um, and, and I think if you also then think about, I think there's another thing that's going to happen here, which is, um, what is it, 2 billion people coming online in the next five years as a result of all of this global internet access that uh, Facebook and Tesla and everybody are pushing. That gives you uh, 2 billion more people worth of ideas who have the same access to the knowledge you and I have, the funding you and I have, the computing power you and I have through cloud and suddenly, you know, there's, there's 2 billion of the consumers and 2 billion potential people who can access a billion people to sell goods, products and goods. So I think in terms of disruption, um, we're right at the starting edge. If we think Uber and Airbnb and all those things are disruptive to the way we live and work, I'm really excited by what is about to happen as a result of easy access, cheap computing and more people on the Internet. One of the things we talk about often on the show, Ismail, is the innovator's dilemma, Clayton Christensen's great work. And one of the things you talk about in the book is actually, well, that's totally been disrupted itself in some ways, because no longer is it a, an, an incumbent being disrupted by a newcomer who brings in a smaller product or a cheaper product like Toyota, for example, in the US in the 50s versus GE and Ford. This time, the use of free and the use of the free economy, the access economy, and the cheap access to capital is changing the game entirely. I'd love you to share this because this is another backdrop of the entire book. I think, of course, 
the, the legend that was Clayton Christensen did, a, did some amazing work on basically saying that in terms of the innovative, innovative di di dilemma, the competition is going to be where you've got your bottom feeders who are going to find cheaper ways of doing parts of your value chain. And, you know, of course, you know, the, this is an oversimplification of the theory. I get that, but just, just to sort of put it into context. But actually what um, has happened, of course, is that we've got over the top approach to change the model rather than make, uh, replicate the model in a cheaper, more efficient way, whatever that business model is. And you, and you talk about Toyota. Of course, you know, the competition to Toyota is Tesla which is a different model, right? I mean, they're not competing. They are very different. And now, of course, everybody is competing against Tesla. Tesla is the incumbent that everybody, everybody stretches. So I, th I think what we've got um, in terms of the things challenging the innovative dilemma is, firstly, your competition might well be coming from two kids in a garage, as Peter Diamandis would put it. You know, you might well um, be, you might have to understand that the power, because of this availability of knowledge, has gone from the buyer, uh, from the seller to the buyer. The buyer knows everything. Um, and in fact, there's, there's this really interesting data point on a B2B perspective. There's some work done by Gartner and others where, you know, from a B2B perspective, if I'm selling to another business, uh, generally, uh, I would be the owner of the knowledge of my product and I'll be telling the other, uh, the buyer, everything about that product. Um, over 50% of all B2B purchases are now made without any contact with the seller. So much knowledge. Not only that, but um, the buyer is through three quarters of the way through the buying cycle before they contact anybody from the selling side, if they were to contact somebody from the selling side. And so this whole, even in a B2B perspective, because you know when we think about the power of data and personalization, we think Amazon, we think consumer, but even in a B2B perspective, we've got this huge disruption because of knowledge shift and therefore challenging the, uh, the, the innovative dilemma work, which said actually the value now sits with the buyer rather than the seller. Um, we've also, you know, the other things that are driving some of the changes to that original work, of course, is that innovation thrives in diversity. That's got to be built into the model. Um, the culture, we talked about culture as well. You know, the best ideas come from the people closest to the clients who are usually, uh, you know, lower in your organization from a hierarchical perspective. So the whole hierarchy needs to be turned upside down. So you've got the servant model uh, approach that now is being talked about a lot. Um, and, 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 I, and I think the, the other thing that's hugely changed is that innovation in business models triumph innovation in products and platforms so you could come out with a, another car or you could come out with a pay-as-you-go service for transport right so the innovation even the idea of innovation isn't just about feature functionality it's about how you live your life just give me innovation about how i live my life and that's what i'm interested in i love that you said there about the you know the ideas and the observations often come from the edges of the organization, those people at the interface between you and the outside world. And I'll just give you an example. So because you, you major in the book a little bit on media, so Netflix, Hulu, etc, cheddar, and it really rang true for me, I was telling you before we came on air, I worked in media, and I started off as an intern. And it was such a huge benefit, because Google analytics was available, many people didn't even ever look at those. And I was doing reports on Google Analytics, sending them on to people who were making decisions who weren't making any decisions. But in doing so, I remember seeing Android coming on. I was like, what's this Android thing? It's, it, it was changing exponentially every week, it was doubling every week, the use the access to our things. And I was like, going, we need an Android app. So we released an Android app. And we were the first media company then to release an Android app. And it was only because a, I had access to the data, and B, I had the authority to do something about it. And that was a game changer for me. But the reason I share that is, you talk about this, if a legacy organization an incumbent actually uses the data that they do have access to, predictive AI, for example, 
they can jump ahead of others by tying it into and using all those advantages that they already have that they built up over decades or even over centuries in some cases. I'd love you to expand on that because that is predictive AI is one of the key game changers that legacy organizations have. I think we should start thinking of Amazon as a legacy organization right now, right? Because, um, and, and they are a great example, but I'll, I'll come on to others, but they are a great example of uh, something that we all understand. We go on uh, Amazon website and it tells us what we should be buying to live our life, right? And that's based on past behavior, the data that they have, the, the purchases that we've made. So in its simplest form, I think that's a great example. And then, you know, we we do a search on uh, cool shoes and every website we go on has the advert for cool shoes. And so, you know, again, there's a whole understanding of our behaviours, what we're looking for and trying to understand and, and, and trying to get uh, access to that. I think, I, think, I think what's going to be really important is, um, is an understanding that everybody is collecting data all of the time. And then... Um, people are trying to, un- and, and there's so much data being collected. I think there's some sort of facts which says there's more data collected in the last 18 months than since the beginning of time, right? Some crazy thing like that. But there's so much data being collected that it's too much for the human be- brain, right? To understand it, to make sense of it. And so the machine learning and AI gets us to a point where you automate trying to get patterns and themes and trying to understand what it might mean to a place where you are given insight. And then the human has to do judgment on that insight, right? So from an AI perspective, it's not the panacea. It doesn't allow you to say, you know, you 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 might get all of the data, but it still might be the wrong judgment if the human make if the human is not allowed to make that judgment. So I think we are on a journey, and ev- at my view, every single organization in the world will be a data AI company, or it's not in business, because that is it's the, it's, it's, it's the core of production is based on data and AI. Um, and I think, I think and, you know, we may, maybe we'll talk about it later on, but I think where this gets really interesting is who owns that data. And what can you do with that data? And what's the ethical, you know, considerations about what you can do with that data? And can you ever change your mind about, you know, you might give somebody permission to say, yeah, Amazon, knock yourself there. Let me know every three weeks what I need. I've changed my mind. Actually, I don't want Amazon or anybody to have my data. I want to be anonymous again. Is it too late? You know, are you always going to have a digital footprint? So I think there's so much, so many quest, more questions than answers, actually. But huge, human, huge amount of opportunity driven by AI and machine learning. I don't know if you heard about this. Mattel, the company who make Barbie, for example, loads of toys we would have played with growing up. One of the products they have, which has got AI in it, is Hello Barbie. So it's a, a doll to which children can communicate. And you think about that and you go, well, ethically, what does it mean if the child shares something that's happened to the child, you know, maybe it's been the child's been abused, shares it with who owns that? And what does the person do with that who received that data? Because because, of course, Barbie has to store that information to go, well, I know this child's name is Ismael, so I need to be able to repeat back her name, or his name. This this kind of ethical challenges we don't even know where it's going to lead you, and this is one of the things you talk to. It raises challenges that we don't even know yet. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that goes back to um, the culture of the company. So if you want to address the challenge before you move forward, which is generally the culture of large organisations because they're managing risk, identify the risk, let me know how you mitigate it, then do the project. Then you're stuck because you don't even know what the risks are as you go down this project, never mind understanding the mitigation of the risks. So the whole risk framework needs to change as well uh, in terms of where are you comfortable progressing, where are you absolutely not comfortable progressing, and what's the grey area, and how do you manage the risks in the grey area? Because a lot of lot of the work that we're doing around um, data and AI and machine learning, don't forget the legislation is lagging. 
uh, and the innovators are going where the legislation allows them to go and try it, and then the rest of the co- countries are catching up. So big question for government as well, by the way. So if you want to attract innovation, you need to have an environment which um, f- nourishes it, and legislation doesn't always do that. So what's the balance between legislation and protection for your citizens versus attracting innovation? One of the huge problems with all this, Ismael, is being able to see patterns in the chaos, but there's always patterns in chaos. And you introduced the idea of Gartner's hype curve, you introduced then Everett Rogers' diffusion of innovations and how that works, etc. But I found it fascinating where you introduced this diagram that comes from the company asimco.com. And I'm going to share now a diagram. This is the verticalization of the S curve, where the S curve is becoming more and more vertical. And actually, the adoption curve is getting shorter and shorter. So I'll share that. And I'd love you to talk over that for our audience. Bear in mind that some of them will be listening to us and not be able to see it. So we'll have a little bit of empathy for that. The way I would categorize this is if you think about the telephone as an innovation technology, and the time it takes for the telephone to get to 100 million people worldwide was 80 years. Telephone, 80 years. If you think about the internet, 100 million people, 14 years. If you think about some of the games that we now see coming on board, 100 million people, five weeks. And that essentially is what this, you know, the adoption rate of consumer in the techno- in the in the consumer technologies adoption rates is getting to such a point that you almost don't get enough time to acclimatize yourself. There's a lot of work, of course, done by the Google founder on how long does it take for you to get used to a new piece of technology, such as your iPhone, which I think was six to seven months. But actually, that's too late because the next set of technology is coming on board. And I think this is actually quite profound in that the adoption rate is massively quick. And we've got the uh, introduction rates to new pieces and new waves of technology coming down. And in amongst all of this is the human being who is trying to adopt and move to the next stage and stay away from anxiety for those of us who want to stay with the latest phase but don't even quite feel comfortable with the last phase. Uh, and, you know, a great example, of course, would be, um, Aiden, you know, so much talk right now around crypto, Bitcoin, the different um, exchanges, value of money, digital cash. I'm, I'm sure as people listen to that, those sorts of discussion, there's an anxiety around why, you know, am I supposed to know all this stuff? Um, who's already adapted this? You know, and you know, is it is it a, you know is it something that's failing? Is it something that I've better get used to? Because don't forget the, the 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 hype curve will tell you that there will be a lot of hype. A lot of people will adopt it. Then there will be the trough of disillusionment, and then there will be the plateau of enlightenment. So ultimately, most people start using the core technologies that are changing our lives. And I and, and I think there's a big thing there, Aiden, around. We as the consumer are being inundated with so much innovation and we are choosing who to listen to, to tell us what we should pay attention to. And so those influences, uh, and and I'm not talking about the Kardashians here, but the influences (laughs) who might tell us what to pay attention to. You watch it, man. Come on. You have to have some downtime. (laughs) Thankfully, it's over. Thank God. (laughs) Uh, you know, they play an increasing important role, right, in what people think is important in terms of technology, innovation, and how our lives change. And you know well, uh, you've worked in so many legacy organizations, you work as a consultant, as an inside consultant working from places like Accenture into organizations. And one of the big problems is the organization is not paying attention to their own data. You know, that was my real learning from that experience of working from the bottom, but having access to the top, it was so valuable. And I often think about the psychological aspect of this where traditionally, the hierarchy in an organization says, Oh, you're down in sector seven G, you don't have a voice. But actually, those people now need to have a voice. I'd love your opinion on that because they're them sharing data or insights or observations up to those people who make decisions has become essential to organizations. Yeah, and there's a great example um, here, Aidan. If you if you remember HMV, do you remember HMV? I spent a lot of time and money in there, man. Well, 
all did, right? We all did. Um, I'm, I'm sure you bought the, uh, the Joshua tree. <laughs> I, believe it or not, man, I, I was drum and bass and techno. I was uh, old school hardcore, so it wasn't the type of place that sold those records. All right, yeah. No, I, I, I was a big U2 fan, so I remember the HMV for 35 years ago, actually, yesterday, apparently, the Joshua Tree album was released. Um, but this, what's well documented is the process by the people in the shops, in the HMV, the workers in the shops, were feeding up to the leadership that digital music is coming and we need to have a different approach. And, you know, what's also well documented is the response from the leadership in terms of, no, this is not what we want to do. Stores are important. Physical records is important. Videos is important. And the whole streaming industry came in and disrupted. And, you know, I don't know if there's any HMV still exists, by the way. But that is, you know, that is a great story, actually, that uh, I think evidences what you're talking about there, which is, you know, the people close to the edge know what's going on and there needs to be a link from the HMV clerk or storekeeper in Bolton to the decision maker back in London. And I think that is even more important right now because while HMV might have had three or four years to react, given the S curve we've just seen, the adoption curve mean you just don't have that sort of time. Fantastic example, Ismail. I love that. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, we've had Rita McGrath on the show a couple of times, and she quotes the brilliant Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel. And he said, the snow melts at the edges. And his point was that exact thing that the edges, those interface between your organization and the outside world is so valuable, but you have to have a way to harness that information and this is again where the ai aspect comes in but i'd love and this is off piste a little bit as i so often do but how you have seen that work positively in organizations i know you mentioned there hmv where it doesn't doesn't work but for somebody listening in a similar role to yourself or a newcomer into an innovation role how do they create those ways to share information Again, if I use a, a real example, if you think about Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime is an idea that somebody puts into a suggestion box back in the day. It's a loss-making uh, business. Um, so the first first point is how do you capture the ideas from the edge that we just talked about? Amazon Prime had a suggestion box. Amazon had a suggestion box at the time. If you remember 3M and the sticky notes. They give their people 15% time to think through ideas and put them into a process. So large organizations have different approaches to do that. And the 3M, by the way, sticking out with somebody's idea, that's just become synonymous with life, really. Amazon Prime was something um, that was uh, suggested by one of the employees. The second thing is the sponsorship of the ideas. Jeff Bezos picked up that one idea. He took it from idea to a business. And again, well documented. And of course, it's a massive business. And, and, and the psychological impact of Amazon Prime allowing people to buy more because everything's free in delivery, uh, you know, has been incredible. Uh, what an amazing idea. But it was loss making, of course, for a huge amount of time. But that then also drove, you know, if you're going to deliver, then that delivery part of the value chain has to be really in, uh, important. So Amazon started working on that part of the value chain. Of course, more business. Uh, more margin and so on. So getting the idea, having a culture of people submitting ideas, having a culture of people having time for ideas, 3M. Sponsorship, Bezos is a great example. Having a, having a culture of listening, innovation. I think Satya Nadella at Microsoft is a rock star in that space. The way he's taken a massive organization which was focused on product and turned them into an organization which is focused on empathy and listening. I mean, his leadership theme is empathy. You know, for, for I think, the second largest, second most valuable company in the world right now. So having a culture around that, and then having the agility to change, to flick as you learn more. Uh, having, having the ability in the organization for ideas to fail and it being okay. Uh, we were writing in the book about um, a process Coca-Cola had, about celebrating people who had tried and failed. Uh, and there was this guy in the Middle East who tried a particular type of Coke in the Middle East, failed and was given an award for trying. Uh, and, you know, so 
you, there's there's a whole series of systematic things that needs to be put in to be able to do what we're talking about, Aiden. But some great examples across the world. I love it, and that example is so good about the failure because it's nudging behaviors it's changing behaviors it's showing that leadership actually cared that you tried it, it doesn't matter about the output it's about the input in the first place but i wanted to bring it back to something that is so important in the book and you frame it very well you articulate it very well here you say when multiple fast moving or exponentially advancing technologies are merged into one product the result is even faster development and improvement so we talked about the adoption curve there for example Thus, naturally, faster development and improvement mean faster maturation and in turn generating swifter adoption. So here you consider a few technologies in this light. The telephone, for example, proved to be revolutionary on the basis of a single innovative technology, conversion of electric signals into sound. And here's the big difference. The smartphone as we know it today was a far more powerful technology and importantly, it incorporated a number of key legacy technologies, camera, telephone, typewriter, maps, and included overlapping, exponentially advancing technologies such as semiconductors, software, geolocation data, and cheap sensors. And I share that to say, you as a head of innovation or a head of change in an organization, often become responsible for all these different things. And it's so difficult to be able to keep on the top of your own learning curve for them all at once. And you go to bat and go, look, I need a head of VR or AR in the organization to be at the cutting edge of what's happening in that world. And you often get batting back and kind of going, oh, hey, we have you, is it not enough? And this is one of the points that that you need multiple versions of Ismael in the company now, and you need teams. And those teams aren't sitting around on beanbags anymore. They're becoming more and more data driven. It's not so much a fun job anymore. It's a very data driven, disciplined role. Yeah, I think I think there's a few things here. One is I think um, the ecosystem which you surround yourself with, so that uh, you get access to all of the, you know, what, what you just described the. Um, What's available on the uh, on the iPhone or the Android phone compared to the telephone, and all of the different work streams that contribute into that, and it, it, you know the ecosystem I, I think uh, that you have around your partners, your your academic institutions, your innovation, your own employees, and so on. I think is important. I think embedding within your own company culture a level of curiosity, which is that change is what is constant. And unless you, as a leadership team, are telling me about what you're changing, you're not doing your job. You know, running is not what's important. Changing is what's important because that is the norm. That is the new competition. And I think that uh, curiosity, learning agility becomes really important. And a core competence of the business, I think Alvin Toffler had this great quote, which is, uh, you know, the core competence of the future is not going to be to be able to read and write but to be able to unlearn and relearn. And I think that is it. That is the learning agility. And if you can get the unlearn, relearn, curiosity ecosystem, then you've got half a chance. <laughs> and only then, even then only half a chance because there's so much going on around you. And that psychological aspect, again, you take that to our children, for example, or the next generations, that they need to learn how to learn. And as you say, how to unlearn, but also the traditional structure of society that oh, you go into a job and you stay in that job for 10 years or 20 years or 40 in the old days, that's gone. And this idea of a more squiggly career, a non linear career an exponential career actually becomes more the norm. Because oftentimes those people who listen to this show mostly, those people who move from role to role are not moving because they were fired or let go or th their company went bankrupt. Some cases, yes, but oftentimes it's going for a bigger challenge or more importantly, they've got to the top of their own S curve of growth. They're tired, they're not feel they're not providing something of service anymore. And they're looking for new challenges, new growth. That's a huge part of societal change as well to your point. It's true. It's true. It's true. I think that this whole idea of two things. One is I think um, th th there's a fact that I read somewhere recently that if you are starting your career today, you're going to have three to five careers, not jobs, careers. 
in your working lifetime, right? And so, do, do, so that's so different from sort of where you and I started in terms of our career. And then there's the gig economy, which is there's the acceptance of people dipping in, in and out of your workforce. And then there's the post-COVID world where not only is there a theoretical acceptance, it sort of happened, people are coming in and out of your workforce. And then there's the whole 2 billion people coming online, which are potentially part of your whole workforce. You put all of that together, and I think the whole workforce that we are used to running becomes very different. And I think it's challenging, actually, Aidan, because if you are trying to drive a culture of a particular purpose-driven, agile, innovative-led, and you never meet your people, all the people are coming in and out, how do you manage that sort of culture versus everybody when you have everybody in the office and you could say to them, look, this is what we believe in. This is how we work. This is how I role model. It's, I think it, it, I, I don't think we fully understood what the new leadership and what the new corporate sort of um, issues and, and priorities are going to have to be. It changes one thing that I'm sure you've seen a lot of, which is L&D or HR, because they're often intertwined and they're not the same thing. There's a mechanical HR we know the payroll administration, all that type of stuff. And then there's the humanic part of it about learning and unlearning, as you say. And that becomes much more important because innovation and learning go hand in hand. But this is something that evades many leadership mindsets that they don't see that unless them, they themselves are learners or learn at all, as Satya Adela would call them. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think it isn't the, if generally... Um, organizations come to the realization that actually our core competence generally is going to be the data that we have and the superpowers that we talked about earlier, brand, distribution channels, clients, so on and so forth. But the innovation is not going to come from what we make, but how we serve our clients, which is going to be agile and it's going to be changing all the time. So then I think what, uh, you know, for the, for, for the organizations who've come to that realization, the ag agility pace of moving, the metabolism of the culture, the DNA becomes really important. And this idea that you're a learning organization, constantly curious, constantly learning the next set of skills. But you're right, it evades most, because it's, it's hard, right? Because it's, it's so core, you know, where are you going to spend your money and your investment and it's generally going to be on something which is going to be easier to define a return to. And both of these things that I've talked about, it's very hard to have a business case around. It's so hard. It's so hard for people to cordon off and ring fence that spending to go into learning because it's like, what's the return on investment? And what if they leave? And you're kind of going, well, what if they don't learn and they stay? But exactly. um, there's a great there's a great part you talk about next, which is the Hall of Toast. And it's well, great. It's it's unfortunate to read about it. But the Hall of Toast, firstly, I love that term you talk about. I had to Google, I was like, what's the Hall of Toast? And then I was like, Oh, no, all these companies that are toast, and recent entrants to the Hall of Toast include Forever 21, for those who haven't heard during the pandemic. And of course, Thomas Cook, which left so many people unemployed. And this is where the learning part becomes imp important, because we're going to see that more and more the speed of toast becoming faster and faster where organizations become bankrupt quicker and quicker. Maybe we'll share a note on that at the speed at which organizations are becoming more bankrupt. But also then an example you give of a great innovator, which was IBM, but is also now running aground. Like you said, Amazon is now a legacy organization. IBM's around for a very long time did unlearn and relearn got into AI very, very early, etc but now is running aground again, because this is not a one off event. This is a new mindset. Yeah, yeah, the, the whole of Toast is quite interesting. So my um, co author, Vivek Wadwe, he's a uh, professor down in Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and he appears on CNN or PBS or all these sound bites. Uh, and his sound bite for effect is that company is in the Hall of Toast. Uh, that's it. And it, it, you know, it's very Americanism. Uh, but it's, I mean, it, make, it makes a good point. And of course, the one that we all know about is Kodak. Kodak, Kodak could have been the Facebook, uh, didn't react, didn't react to, you know, what was coming from the edge. And, and they really are in the, in the Hall of Toast. Um, yeah, so I, th I think uh, if, if you think about IBM, and I have some experience about IBM, but so much, so much has been written about IBM. Um, they went through multiple changes uh, in terms of um, 
the, 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 you know, they were in the big computer, they were, well, they, they were in the typewriters, they were in the big machines, they were in the small machines. Um, and, and there's a great example we talk about in the book when they entered the uh, PC computer market. I don't know if you remember that, Aiden, where Apple, who was in the PC computer market, put an advert in the Wall Street Journal when IBM said, we're going to the PC computer market, Apple put an advert saying, welcome, because you finally realized that we were right, that the, the hands, the computing power in the hands of the individual is more important than the power of the corporate. It's a really, really smart way of owning the space, uh, I thought. But I think, I think the story with IBM, um, well documented, the recent story I would say is in terms of shifting to AI, um, and this comes down to, I think, business decision making, right? So as IBM shifted from, you know, the last uh, wave they were going through into AI, a lot of the competition shifted to cloud. So AI, of course, being um, a user of, of machine learning and data and infrastructure, but the big shift that was going on at the time was the shift to cloud. And so, uh, and then IBM tried try to reposition uh, and, and are still repositioning as to what part they play in there. And you could argue that actually IBM had the most permission to shift the code, given they were running and are still running some of the biggest infrastructures in the world. Now it's part of Kindle, of course, IBM split up. So I think they created the mind, and the good news is that they created the mindset set around AI. You remember Watson. You remember the whole um, game show that Watson won, won, won in. I think it largely missed the cloud and data market. It's now focusing in on what it's going to be um, uh, focused on in, which is software businesses in particular areas. They've shifted out their hardware business into this new business called Kindle, uh, and they're going to focus in on um, the edge of the cloud, if you like. They had the Red Hat acquisition uh, and the facilitation of the different crowd is going to be more important. So it, it seems like the market is more comfortable now than they were a couple of years ago, uh, given the focus from Arvin and the leadership team. I think focus is a great great thing, actually, in this particular space. Uh, I think time will tell because it's around execution. But I do think the current strategy of saying we're going to be focused on particular software areas and owning, owning the cloud facilitation with the Red Hat technology seems to be a good play. But things are moving so fast, they're going to have to shift again before they know it, I guess. To your point there, you know, one of the things you talk about in the book is a good example is Tesla, where they've shifted their mindset from going, we're not really a car company, we're a software company that makes cars. But also, we've identified some of the challenges in that one of which, you know, driverless cars, but also electric vehicles is the batteries. So they develop these capabilities in these new skills. And I wanted to type, type, if you keep that in your mind over here, and then you look back on what you said there about IBM and say Amazon, Amazon had developed AWS, the powerhouse, the profit house of Amazon. But in doing so, they developed an ability to be able to sell little slices of this. And then they just applied it to machine learning or AI. And they're able to offer that to me. So I don't need to go with my data, you know, and I often think of, you know, a USB key going into the massive IBM house and plugging into this massive AI Watson machine. I don't need to do that anymore. It comes to me. And it's that ability to to sell abil capabilities that you have in your organization, but also to be able to recognize that you have that capability, which is a huge shift in the business environment. Yeah, and, and the way I would categorize what you just said there is, that, is that this is a little bit of um, on-demand anything. Uh, uh, and, you know, you could even call it dumbed down, right? So I don't want, as you say, I don't want to implement a huge bit of infrastructure to be able to get what I want and pay for all of this up front. I want to pay for it as I use it, and I want somebody else to take away all of the challenges of setting up all of the infrastructure, which is what Amazon and AWS did really well, but this other service and um, as a everything, I think is is another it's another trend actually that is supported by all of this change going on. Uh, you know, how do you move away from all of that complexity? I just want to be worried about the outcome, and and some of the business consumer trends going into the B two B trends as well. I think uh, is what we're seeing in that space. 
Yeah, and one of the things, one of the capabilities or the recognition of a gap in the market that Amazon have, I mean, they're in everything, as we know. But one thing you note in the book about is that some people may not know this, and I wanted to share this, is that because retail margins in the retail apocalypse, in particular, we've seen this now gap, people like gap in trouble at the moment, are very thin, because these margins are thin. Retailers are often stretched by supply chains that demand advance payment for goods that consumers may not purchase for a full year. So they have to get ahead of themselves. And Amazon now offers loans and other financing to tens of thousands of merchants who do small business on the site, often undercutting other financial houses. Perhaps we'll share a bit on Amazon and that type of mindset in the organization, the ability because of their access to their own data to be able to spot gaps in the market. There's two things here. I think I think if you think about Amazon, you think customer obsession. What is it the customer wants to do and say and feel and they may want to borrow money at the time of purchase, to your point. Data are the king of everything. And I think what you'll find is uh, the use of their da- the data from everybody who's using their sites is theirs. They can do what they like. This, you know, they made that a key uh, objective, which I think is amazing. They've been really bold, uh, and they have a culture biased towards action. But one of the things that you're saying there, Aidan, which I think maybe we'll pick up later on, is the coming together of industries. So if you think about Amazon, Amazon, a bookseller, a retailer, uh, IT services provider, a financial services provider, um, there's all sorts of industries coming together. And especially as we think about retail and financial services and financial services being embedded in everything, all other industries, I think that they're leading uh, in many ways the coming together of these industries of massive technology uh, innovation. So if you think about Amazon Go, you go into a store, you come out, you don't pay anybody. They just worked out what you've bought. And at the, uh, at the time that you buy you've got the opportunity to do financial services. So you've got technology, retail, and financial services all coming together. I think I think that's a great example of models being the innovation rather than products themselves. In part two, Ismail, it's not all doom and gloom, this book. It paints the challenge for organizations at the start, talks about the Hall of Toast as we know it. But the next day in part two, we'll look at Walmart, Target, Best Buy, British grocery chain Sainsbury's as examples of how legacy companies can and do innovate. But it's equally important to understand that competition with large established firms is coming not only from the likes of Amazon, but also from skyrocketing new startups that come out of nowhere. One of those great examples you give is Allbirds, who went from zero to 1 billion in only two years. What an incredible company. And, and, I, and I bet you've got uh, people you know who have totally bought into the Allbirds uh, brand. Uh, and they did. And, and I, I think it's around two or three things. So they have a purpose, which is very clear that buyers associate with. So they, they themselves say they've gone to the opposite of Nike. They want you to buy one pair of shoe and wear it for years. So their model is sustainability. But they then have a set of constant innovation, and they talk about one particular shoe being changed 30 times in two years. So innovation on one shoe changed 30 times in two years. And then they have this sustainability approach around naturally derived materials, uh, which, of course, attract a particular type of audience. So it's really interesting, you know, um, something like shoes and especially trainers, you'd think, you know, with ASICs, with Nike, with Adidas, the investment, the brand, the whole channels, that would not be something that you could go disrupt. And here you have a disruptor coming up, going to this sort of valuation in two years time. And the understanding, as you talk about in the book of the trends, for example, sustainability, environmental ESG, all those things, understanding them as well as the technological trends as well. Last company we'll talk about today, which is a great example of understanding Moore's law, understanding the power of exponentially advancing technologies, and actually having the bravery to go for it is Reed Hastings and Netflix and leaning into those technologies and making bold bets on the futures pivoting from an original DVD business. This is a prime example and one a positive one that we'll leave our listeners with today. 
great example of a uh, number of technologies coming together. So huge computing power. And I think at one stage they were the biggest user of computing power in the world as they were creating this business. Um, just an acceptance that street, I mean, if you just look back 10 years and somebody would have said that all the movies that you'll be watching will be streaming, you'll probably say, I'm not sure. I don't get that experience. You know, I get all these glitches. They just bet on the fact that the bandwidth would increase, it would get faster, it would get cheaper. I either understood Moore's law, they understood the curves. So they bet on that fact, and then they built a model around it. So they built a model which said, I'm going to go directly to consumer. I'm going to be, it's going to be really personalized because I'm going to go, every, I'm going to know everything about what that consumer likes. And I'm going to make content available in an as you go basis. Um, and then internally, if you look at some of the data that comes out about the culture they built, the way they manage their teams, I think it's becoming uh, sort of leading edge practice in terms of some of the HR policies, uh, in terms of innovation, managing your team for performance, having small teams, culture becoming so important and so on. So I think, I think, uh, um, and, and then the other thing is, you know, they, they made the, uh, the, the whole inroads and then they've, stayed agile so they then started to produce their own content i.e on the value chain like amazon did i they understood the trends in the market um made it more and more personal um and so i I, th I think as we all know and we're probably all users of netflix uh fantastic standard that some some of the others are now trying to follow of course with prime video and hulu and some of the other over-the-top offerings but a great example of a startup disrupting a whole industry so in the next episode, and I hope you enjoyed this, I absolutely did. And we've only gotten through part one of the book, we look at why legacy organizations fail, and what company innovation now hinges upon. So we'll look on the more positive side of disruption and how organizations can actually lean into it and succeed in this exponentially changing world. Ismael, for you, where can people find you to find out more about keynotes, etc? Yeah, I think the best... Uh um, platforms is probably LinkedIn, Ismail Amla, um, or Twitter. Again, Ismail Amla, one name. I uh, look forward to connecting with people who are also curious in this space. Author of From Incremental to Exponential, How Large Companies Can See the Future and Rethink Innovation. Ismail Amla, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Very enjoyed it. Aiden, thank you. Thank you as always to our partner Zai. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services by powering its customers and making innovative financial services accessible to all. Check them out on hellozai.com. See you next week for another installment of the Exponential series here on The Innovation Show.